everyone, and welcome back for the second day of the University of Minnesota Meet Your Pollinators webinar series. Today is the second session of a three-part series, and Dr. Elaine Evans will be speaking on pollinator identification. So just like yesterday, I'd like to go over how we can all engage with each other over in a Zoom webinar format. So please use the Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions you may have. So I'll be asking the speakers questions only from that section. For any comments, please use the chat feature. Since we have a wonderfully engaged audience where many folks share their own observations and experiences, if the chat ever gets too distracting from the presentation, you can always use the up arrow or the carrot in the chat feature and then click or unselect the show the chat preview. We had a lot of chats going on yesterday. So just in case you wanted to focus just on Elaine's presentation. These presentations will be recorded and we will be emailing those recordings out on Friday of this week. I will also include all of the links that will be shared during the presentations in that email. So don't worry if you don't catch them all. Next slide, please, Elaine. Thank you. Shout out to our amazing team because I love to brag about them. So joining us here today is Robin Trott, extension educator in Douglas County, Katie Druitz, extension educator in Fillmore and Houston counties, and myself, Tara Young, local extension educator in Hubbard County. Uh, Robin and Kate will be in the background helping answer any questions, for which I am very grateful. And Elise Bernstein, yesterday's speaker, is also joining us today uh, from the B-Lab. So on to Dr. Elaine Evans and her presentation. Elaine Evans is a University of Minnesota Extension educator and researcher working on pollinator education and research relating to bee conservation. She completed her MS and PhD in entomology at the University of Minnesota. She has authored several books, Befriend Befriending Bumblebees, A Guide to Raising Local Bumblebees and Managing Alternative Pollinators. Her work helps to monitor pollinators, improve the impact of pollinator habitat, raise awareness of the importance of pollinators and provide action steps for pollinator conservation. We are ready for you, Elaine. All right, thank you, Tara. I am um, excited to be here today and talking to you about um, pollinator ID. So in yesterday's talk, Elise gave uh, uh, great information about why pollinators are important and what we can do to help them. So today I'm focusing mostly on um, how to how to get to know the pollinators, how to um, tell some of them apart. So we're gonna start out kind of broad and narrow in as, as much as we can. Um, for a lot of these groups of pollinators will be, will be um, kind of having to stick kind of broad, but at the end we will get down to some species level ID for some bumblebees. So if any of you are um, naturalists, if you're used to going out and birding and you can learn all these different species of birds, it's a little bit different for bees. So a lot of times we have to be happy with kind of a family level or genus level. We're not always able to get down to species. So just a caveat for, uh, for ID. Um, and what we'll be doing. I did want to talk for a minute before we launch into the pollinators about um, about kind of what pollinators are. So pollinators is this pretty broad group of things. So it's just um, animals that are helping to move pollen between flowers. So that action of moving the pollen helps those plants to produce fruits, seeds, and nuts. There's a lot of those that we eat. They also help create the next generation of plants that will be feeding and housing countless other creatures. These plants are also crucial for soil and water health. So, um, so you know, we're looking at these these little tiny things, but they're connecting to this really big picture where our ecosystem depends on healthy and diverse pollinator populations. For who pollinators are, some of the broad groups there are bees, um, they are collecting pollen to feed their young, which is different than a lot of other pollinators. So they tend to move more pollen than a lot of other pollinators, which is why a lot of times when people 
start talking about pollinators pretty soon, you'll find that they're just talking about bees. I know I'm guilty of that. But there are other creatures that are out there that are important pollinators in, in different systems and for different kinds of plants. So flies um, are, are attracted to flowers. They're mostly drinking nectar. A lot of times they'll be on flowers that smell more like um, rotting meat or dung, not like the super sweet smells, but um, they do, um, they, they can be really abundant in some landscapes and for some flowers can be really important pollinators just because there's so many of them that are out there and they're really diverse as well um, and, and really beautiful creatures. Then we have butterflies and moths. A lot of people are familiar with butterflies and moths. Um, for their action as pollinators, they're um, again focused mostly just on gathering nectar, not on gathering pollen, but they do pick up pollen kind of as they're drinking nectar. And one of the unique characteristics in terms of pollination for butterflies and moths is that they tend to fly farther than a lot of the other pollinators. So for um, plants that are spreading their genes across the landscape, those butterflies and moths can be pretty important. And then um, wasps. So there are a lot of different wasps. They're also mostly focused on the nectar. They move a lot of pollen around besides pollinating there are a lot of wasps that also provide a lot of important pest control services. For um, the next kind of round of pollinators, there are also beetles that you'll see on flowers. And these have a really ancient relationship with flowers. So beetles were among the first insects to pollinate flowers around 140 million years ago. There are also birds in Minnesota. The only bird we have here um, that does a significant amount of pollinating are the, the hummingbirds. A lot of times the, the bird pollinated flowers are, are red. A lot of times they don't have a lot of smell to them, but there are flowers that are, are um, reliant more on, on birds than other pollinators. Bats can be really important in desert and tropical systems for moving pollen around. We do have bats here in Minnesota, but none of our bats we have here are pollinators. Um, so someone was asking if there are any pollinators that seek out pollen specifically besides bees, or if they're mostly incidental pollinators. There are some, um, some wasps that will will eat the pollen themselves. So it's a lot of the, the insects that are, are visiting the flowers, you know, they're, they're attracted to the nectar. They will eat some pollen themselves um, and, and some of them will, will seek it out. It's mostly accidental. A big difference with bees is that they're gathering the pollen and carrying it home to feed their young. So they end up gathering a lot more pollen. So the other ones that eat pollen, they're just kind of eating it themselves. They're not sticking it all over their body and then flying around other flowers um, and, and then bringing it home to the nest, which is, is part of why um, bees end up moving so much more pollen around. So looking at these kind of minor players, we've got the moths and butterflies, birds and beetles. And I just wanted to go over a few of these that, um, that you'll see around in the Midwest commonly. And um, one of these um, for, for the butterflies and moths, I wanted to highlight the hummingbird moth. In Minnesota, we have four different species of these hummingbird moths. And at first you might think this was a bee if you, you um, see them flying around. Um, but we'll talk about the differences between them, um, how to tell them apart from bees later. But um, these are, are um, really interesting moths that, um, that you can notice flying around, um, visiting flowers. They have these um, long tongues and will, will hover around the flowers. Um, they're called a hummingbird moth because they, they are um, you know, fairly large size and they hover in a similar way and kind of zoom around like the, the hummingbirds do. Also, I just wanted to talk, mention the, the monarch butterfly. A lot of people are familiar with, with monarch butterflies, um, but they're, they're very charismatic, very interesting butterflies of conservation concern. And, um, and just to be, um, 
aware of um, of that they they are pollinators. So um, besides visiting milkweed, um, depending on milkweed as caterpillars as insects, the adults will seek nectar from a wide variety of different kinds of plants. So um, so the adults flying around um, will be will be there moving pollen around for a lot of different nectar producing flowers. For um, birds here in the, the Midwest, we've got the um, ruby throated hummingbird and um, and you'll see them um, visiting visiting various flowers. I know sometimes, um, so they're they're typically most attracted to these kind of to to the red flowers. There's some that are that they that there are really kind of more specific for them, but they'll visit a, a wide range of flowers too. So sometimes I see hummingbirds visiting the um, bee balm, which is also a very popular plant with um with the bees but it has the flower has these kind of long tubes and the the hummingbirds will will come up and gather nectar from them one of the most common insects that you'll see out um, especially in the prairies in the fall in the the midwest is the goldenrod soldier beetle so um, it has goldenrod in their name, but they're not just on goldenrod. These are very abundant in the in the late summer. So when they're um, young, the the larvae uh, will feed on insect eggs in in leaf litter. But then um, when they become adults, they move up onto flowers, and um, you'll frequently see them around on flowers. Um, they're eating nectar. A lot of times they're hanging out there and mating. There'll be tons of them. So they have this this kind of oblong shape with that kind of um, golden orange color and those and those black markings. So I'm sure if you if you um, once you have your eyes open looking out for these, you'll see a lot of them in the fall and, and late summer. Moving into the the major players. So these are um, insects that are are moving more pollen around are more important pollinators for for a lot of different plants so we've got bees flies and wasps and so so here i want you to just to have a brain exercise here and just in your head picture a bee and think about what you see so just take a second take a deep breath and just think, think, what is a bee? What does a bee look like? If we look at what people in, um, in our culture in general have out there as, um, as what bees look like, they're, a lot of times they are yellow and black stripy creatures. And, um, and you know, you, a lot of times people focus on there being a being a stinger. There's various numbers of wings, um, antennae, things like that. Um, but um, everything that is yellow and black and stripy is not necessarily a bee. So um, we have uh, all of these different creatures here are. Um, are not bees actually. So um, there, there are some things that are really good at looking like bees. So why would there be so many lookalikes? So this is a, a poll that we have for you that um, somebody can launch the poll here. So we're, we're thinking about why are there so many stripy and buzzy insects on flowers? So a lot of these things that are kind of looking the same. So different, different possible reasons. Stripes make you look thinner. Stripes help you blend in with the flowers. Predators get stung by stripy things and learn to leave them alone. Or insects visiting flowers can more easily see and hear um, when other insects are on the flowers, because they have these bright patterns, and they can go elsewhere. So I um, want you to um, 
see what you think. All right. Um, let's see if I if I hit close, I can see the answers. I assume. What happened? You should. I did stop the poll. You should. Okay. See the answers. I don't. <laughs> I can verbally say them. So it looks like fifty eight percent of people said number three. All right. And yeah, number three is is absolutely right. So uh, there are um, a lot of things that that look like bees that um, and some of them have stings and some of them don't. But um, but a lot of them benefit from um, from from there being lots of stripey things that that do have stings and predators can can learn to leave them alone. Um, so um so we end up it ends up being kind of trickier when you're looking out at flowers and you want to tell them apart, tell the different creatures apart from each other we have to deal with um with trying to to tell them apart from each other um i do see a, a question here in the q a about um does the uh, about beetles so i'll just answer that before we're we're moving on from beetles does the presence of milkweed beetles affect the use of milkweeds by monarch butterflies? Um, and I, so, so milkweed beetles are these, they're these um, red with black dots on them, um, fairly large size beetles that can be really common on, um, on milkweed plants. And, um, I am, to the best of my, my knowledge, they do not affect um, the the visitation to the to the milkweeds um, by by at least the the adult monarchs that are that are visiting the flowers i'm not a monarch expert so i'm not sure if they if they um when they're doing their their things on the plants if they have any impact on the um on the younger monarchs that are are hanging out there Elaine, yeah. I just looked. I I just looked into a website called Save Our Monarchs, and it said that those milkweed, any of the bugs that are on milkweed, there there are a number of them, but specifically the milkweed beetles, they don't. They just eat the milkweed. They don't. They don't bother the larvae. The any of them, their presence doesn't bother the monarch, and they don't eat enough to make it hard for the monarch larvae to find food. So it, they yeah. coexist. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I know in general there there are some predators that will go around and and eat the monarch eggs. Um, you know th those are all part of kind of the natural process. There's, I forget the numbers, but there's way, 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 way more eggs that are laid by by monarch laid by monarchs than reach it to adulthood. And those main stress points for them are are not anything to do with 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 predators with the kind of natural predators that they have a lot of the obstacles for the monarch population monarchs are of conservation concern but um the main kind of um points where their their populations have problems are with with habitat and some of that habitat is from um also exp um, from from herbicides that are used and 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 will kill off milkweed that the the larva depend on um, or are killing off the nectar plants so um, habitat is really the biggest um, pinching point for those monarch populations all right so looking into now these um, these different types of of pollinators if we have these flies bees and wasps that are all looking yellow and black and stripey and are sometimes buzzing around, hovering around on flowers. What do we, um, how do we tell them apart? So when we're looking at, is it a bee? 
one of the first things we can look at is the body shape. So bees have more of an hourglass body shape with a with a waist. You'll a lot of times see pollen being carried on them somewhere, a lot of times on their legs, sometimes on their bellies. They'll have these long elbowed antennae. Their eyes are kind of um, on the side of their faces. Their faces are usually kind of oval. Um, a lot of times they, they hold their wings over their back when they're at rest. And their, their heads are a lot of times kind of triangular or tear shaped. When we are looking at things and their, their flies, some of the differences there is they, their eyes are much bigger. And they, a lot of times they cover most of the face. The antennae will be really short and hard to see. The body shape tends to be more stout. They have a less obvious waist. Um, a tricky thing here, they only have one pair of wings. It can be hard to count how many wings something has when it's flying around on a flower. But a lot of times when they're at rest on the flower, they have them out at these 45 degree angles rather than kind of flat against their back like the bees or wasps. Um, their heads are a lot of times rounder and larger. Moving on to wasps. So um, their body shape is often um, long and slim. They also have a distinct waist like the bees, but sometimes it's even easier to see. They also have these um, long oval shaped eyes. They also have long antennae like the bees do. They have the, the two pairs of wings. Um, but some will have have these long visible ovipositors and they they tend to be more um less hairy than than the bees are and kind of thinner you also um it, they'll, they'll get pollen on them but you won't see like pollen packed on their bodies like you will with a lot of the bees so putting that into this kind of table format we've got flies that have two wings Bees and wasps have four wings. Again, kind of hard to see when things are just flying around to the flowers. Um, for the eyes on the flies, they'll take up most of the face. Bees and wasps, um, they'll be, they, they both won't take up as much space. The hind legs are something to pay attention to. So, so the hind legs on both flies and wasps will be skinny, whereas on bees, they will have a, a thicker hind leg. And this is something that, um, you know, whenever you you talk about biology, whenever you're looking at nature, there's always exceptions to everything. But this is one character that's, that's really consistent. So this is actually part of how bees are defined is by having that thicker hind leg. Also by the branched hairs. So I'll show a picture of this in a second, but but in in general, this just means bees are fuzzier than either wasps or flies. Those antennae on the flies will be short and stubby, long antennae on the wasps. Another thing that's really handy when you're actually out there looking at flowers, looking at pollinators on flowers, is um, what are they doing? So when you see flies, they, um, they're off, often hover. So they often fly kind of, you know, zoot, 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 zoot. they're able to just <laughs> kind of zoom around like that every direction. Um, when they're sitting there, a lot of times they, they, you've probably seen house flies do this where they just take their hands and rub it all over their, their heads. Um, that's just a fly thing. Um, <laughs> a lot of the flies are doing that when they're, when they're sitting on the flowers. Um, when you see bees on flowers, a lot of times they're really active in the flower, getting into the pollen. You can see them kind of mixing, getting their bodies mixed in there, really trying to grab the pollen, um, getting into where the nectar is, being really kind of purposeful in how they're, they're, they're visiting the flowers. Whereas wasps, they're, they're pretty much just getting nectar. They'll just be kind of landing on the flower, getting some nectar, not necessarily um, getting deep into the flowers. So again, here's just some visuals with the flies to show you what we're talking about. So they've got these, these large eyes, stubby antennae. Um, so they're usually less hairy, but some there's some exceptions. There are some, this is uh, in the middle is a robber fly, which these are really good bumblebee mimics and um, they can be really hairy. But um, if you look at them, they have these, these um, weird eyes, 
um, kind of larger eyes. I say they're weird just because I'm a bee person. So I'm used to looking at bees and they don't look like bee eyes. Um, and they're not carrying pollen anywhere. For the wasps, some of them can be, they can be kind of hairy, but they won't be super fuzzy. And so they tend to be kind of sleeker. A lot of times they'll have long legs. Um, and if you look under the scope, the hairs are unbranched. And um, I'm just gonna, gonna go forward here for a second to show you, show you what I mean, and then I'll go back. Um, so this is what branched hairs look like. So bees have these, all of these little, it looks like a stalk of wheat. Whereas on wasps, it'll just be one straight piece that comes up. So um, there are lots of really interesting wasps out there. Um, there are a lot of different shapes and colors and sizes, and a lot of them are, are visiting all kinds of different flowers. Um, some of them you might see out there, the, the great golden digger wasps. This is a beautiful, big, striking um, orange and black wasp. The great black wasp, that's, uh, these are both um, Sphex species. And um, these can be really common on some flowers. They, I know they really like the um, dotted, um, dotted bee balm is uh, really popular with the, with the great black wasps. The smoky winged beetle bandit, this one is um, a really cool one because not only does it go around to visit flowers and pollinate, but they also parasitize the um, emerald ash borers. So um, and, and I, in my neighborhood in St. Paul here, they're going around and cutting down uh, hundreds of ash trees over the next couple weeks. So very sad to lose those trees. This is a, a wasp that can help bite off those beetles. And um, Bembix, these are sand, sand wasps um, and you will, they, they can be kind of frequent and in, in beaches or in parks with, with sandy soil, but they're, they're solitary, they're harmless, they're great pollinators. Oh, oops. Yeah, I, I see that I do have a mistake on the, the, the species names. Um, I'm sorry, this, the second one is in Pennsylvanicus, but I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. <laughs> oh, I think Elise, Elise has the answer going for you. <laughs> um, it was a qu question in the Q&A. For moths, um, so they weren't in that chart there, but just um, a reminder for for moths for talk think for telling them apart from these other groups, they don't have um, they they don't have a, a a thin waist like the bees and the wasps do. A lot of times their antennae are long and straight, um, and there are there are some that are that are really good bee and and wasp mimics out there for just so make sure to keep your eyes out for them. So for, um, for, for digger wasps here in Minnesota, we have two different species of, of digger wasps. Um, they have um, long abdomens with thin, thin waist, a lot of times confused with, with paper wasps, um, but they are yeah, great pollinators. The adults also um, will feed on other insects. Paper wasps, um, have also have these thin wastes. Um, they make these distinctive paper nests that um, with, with, so these are not the huge paper nests that, you, that you'll see in trees, but they make just like the little tiny ones that are a lot of times attach, attached to people's um, house eaves is a popular place for them. And um, they also will feed on, um, on caterpillars and other insects that they use to, to feed their young, but as adults, they're going around visiting flowers to get some nectar. And um, the ever popular yellow jackets. So um, most of us are familiar with these. You may not realize how many different yellow, kinds of yellow jackets there are. So there's some that are native, some that are not native, but we have nine different species in Minnesota. And, um, 
And so they can be, a lot of times we run into these because they can be um, protective of their nests. So they do have these large, the large paper nests that can be either underground, sometimes they're, they're up in trees, um, but those colonies do die out each fall. Those adults are also, um, you know, going, going after their pests and things like that. Um, Someone asks, um, are, are most wasp species also ground nesting like bees? I usually think of them as, as cavity nesters. Um, so there's, there's a wide variety. So there are um, wasps that will, will nest in stems and other cavities. Some of them um, make nests underground. Some of them like these paper wasps will, will um, either be underground or up in trees where they create their nest structure. So wasps are really diverse and have a ton of different, um, different behaviors, different types of nests that they make. One of the really common types of flies that you'll see um, as pollinators visiting flowers are flower flies. So they even have flower in their name. There, um, this is a family of, of flies and there's over 125 different species just in Minnesota. And um, so, so these um, are, are not very hairy, they will, but they will a lot of times have yellow and black stripes. There's a lot of different colors actually for the flower flies, um, but the, um, the young flower flies, the, the flower fly larvae are um, important for um, eating, eating other pests. So especially aphids, and other plant pests. So these are a beneficial insect that people a lot of times try to, to encourage for, for pest control as young. And then as adults, they also are, are pollinators. So a couple of resources I wanted to share with you, because um, I'm just kind of talking about these a bit. Clearly, there's a lot of diversity of both flies and wasps. These are two great books that are um, that are resources if you want to find out more about either of these groups. So Flower Flies of Minnesota, this will apply to a lot of states around the Midwest, um, goes through, a, um, if you want to dig, in, dig into I beyond just flower fly and figuring out what different types of flower flies you have around that's a great resource for id of flower flies there's also this this um guide to eastern north american wasps i'm just gonna <laughs> grab mine off the shelf here so you can see maybe you can see how big this book is oops it's blending into the flower i'm all blending in <laughs> you get the idea a nice big book with tons of information about wasps. And if you don't like, if you think you don't like wasps, I challenge you to get that book and read through it and not be fascinated by what they're doing and stunned by their beauty. So next I'm going to um, move on to, to bees. So um, these are all different bees pictured here. So bees are, are also a very diverse group for what bees are. Sometimes people just say, what are bees? If we look at what's happened through evolutionary history, bees are really just kind of a special wasp. So they're really closely related to wasps um, and they share ancestry with them. And kind of the main difference with bees is that they switched to using pollen and nectar to feed their young rather than insect prey. So that's kind of just biologically the main difference between um, what, what makes bees different. There are um, a lot of different kinds of bees, as I mentioned. And um, if going back to that kind of exercise we did where, you know, we're picturing what a bee is, a lot of us probably, I'm not going to assume what everybody pictured because um, we all have different experiences, but a lot of people may have pictured something that looked like a bumblebee or a honeybee. This pie graph here is showing um, how many species there are of these different types of bees in the United States. 
And so honeybees and bumblebees take up a pretty tiny slice of what is this whole diversity of bees that we have um, in, in the United States. So, um, so yeah, just increasing your, um, your mind picture of what a bee is, you can start to see a lot of other things showing up at flowers that you may not realize were bees. And we already talked about the branch hairs. So this is something that you're you know, probably not gonna notice when you're just looking out at bees that are on flowers. But um, if you get a chance to look at bees close up under a microscope, you can, can see this feature pretty easily. And the main thing that you can see is you'll just see more pollen sticking onto the bees. So the function of this branch of the branched hairs is that those branched hairs are helping the bees to collect more pollen. So the result of that is you'll just see bees with pollen stuck on them. So that is um, is something that um, that you know you're you're likely to um, more likely to see than noticing the branch hairs. I am um, going to um, oh someone is asking in the B pie chart what are the symbols um, just before I move away from that I'll just let you know that this is a um, is a, a um, PDF that is available on the B Lab website so we'll be sharing the link for the B Lab website and um, this and, and everything is explained in that PDF. But um, basically, these these symbols are are saying things about where they nest, if they nest in tunnels, or if they nest underground, um, or, um, or or if they are social and aggregating in their in their nesting. Um, so so yeah. There's a lot of different information that we could just spend um, probably 20 minutes just talking about on, on kind of unpiecing what is in this graphic. But if you want to dig further, I encourage you to um, to visit the B-Lab website and um, get all the, the info that's in there. For, um, for today, I wanted to um, cover some of the bees that you are likely to see. So we've we've kind of covered some of the common wasps and flies that you're likely to see out there. You're also um, going to run into a lot of different bees once you kind of open up your mind picture to what bees are. And um, so these are some of the groups that, that we're going to talk about today. So the bees are grouped at the family level in, into Andranidae, Coletidae, Helictidae, Megachylidae, and Apidae. So Andranidae are sometimes called minor bees. Coletidae are, are either the yellow-faced bees or plaster bees. Helictidae are called sweat bees for their common name. Megachylidae are, are hairy-bellied bees. They include leafcutter bees, mason bees. Um, Apidae is kind of a broad group that has um, bumblebees, honeybees, chap legged bees, small carpenter bees. So this is just for the real nature nerds that want to know the, the family relationships of, of what we're talking about. Here's that information for you. Um, but we're going to focus for most of this just on things that you're likely to see and characteristics to hone in on to help you just tell some of these things apart from each other. Um, if you have a pollinator garden or if you're planning on planting a pollinator garden, these are the things that you're likely to see show up and um, can get to know who they are a little bit more by um, getting to their names. So for um, a lot of places across the Midwest, you're probably going to see honeybees. So um, honeybees are not native in North America, but um, but people have brought them here. A lot of times um, you'll see them if someone is keeping bees near you. Because um, honeybees have had health problems over the last um, that have been worse over the last 15, 20 years. There's not as many that are just kind of living off on their own. It does happen still, but it's most likely that if you're seeing honeybees, there's somebody near you that is managing the colonies and keeping them healthy. 
So um, for, for, for honeybees, you can look for them having um, these collecting baskets on the hind leg where they put pollen. And if you can't see the, the pollen basket, you might just see a clump of pollen that's stuck on there. So they, they mix the pollen with a little bit of nectar. It'll be this kind of shiny ball that's stuck on their back leg below kind of their, they have, they have a couple knees in their leg, but it's the section below kind of the first big bend in their leg. They'll, um, and just on their hind leg. So they have three sets of legs, just the back pair is where they will, will collect pollen. They have these long bodies. A lot of times they're um, brown or orange, but they can be all dark brown. So depending on the variety of, of honeybee, there are, um, they are, um, you know, that they, they can vary that, that much in color. Um, so someone is asking how far um, honeybees go, um, how they, um, what range from the hive and um, honeybees will, so if you're seeing honeybees in your yard, there's likely somebody keeping bees within two miles of where you are. They can fly farther, but most of those honeybees will be just foraging between one and two miles away from their, their hive. If you are a beekeeper and you're wanting to provide food, it's important to realize that they need a lot of food and they need that food across a broad range. A couple um, other features to pay attention to. So a kind of fun thing with honeybees is that they have hairs on their eyes. Not all bees have this. So one of the things, if you're not sure if it's a bee, if you're able to get a close-up look, you'll be able to actually see hairs growing right out of the eyes. Um, another big thing is just looking for these pollen baskets. The next group of bees I want to talk about is the um, our bumblebees. And we'll be talking about these more at the end of the session to get into some um, species level ID, which is always exciting. But these are um, closely related to honeybees. They also have those pollen collecting baskets on the hind leg. So same deal, same spot, same thing to look for there. But um, bumblebees are usually stouter and hairier than, than honeybees are, um, can have a lot of different kinds of colors of hair, usually yellow and black, but there are red, orange, brown, white, all kinds of different colors that can, can show up for them. So um, curbicula is another name for the pollen basket. So this is zoomed in on the hind leg where you can, you can kind of see here why it's called a basket. So it has this kind of smooth center that kind of dips down and it's surrounded by these stiff hairs that are, that are like a basket that help hold the pollen in. Um, and so both honeybees and bumblebees are social bees. So they will have um, colonies that have a queen and workers and a whole bunch of, of um, bees living together in one colony. Most of the other bees we're going to talk about are solitary. They don't have that structure. They just have a mom laying an egg in um, in a tunnel or um, underground somewhere in a stem and then she just kind of leaves them alone. The next group of bees, these are called chap-legged bees. Sometimes people also call them longhorned bees. So um, this is a male here. The males have really long antenna, which is why they're called um, longhorned bees. But the females have these, um, they're carrying their pollen below, below their knee in these brushes. So this is different than those baskets. So if we look at the, how the, Bumblebees carrying pollen in the basket, it just gets kind of crammed into a ball on her hind leg. For the chap leg bees, they have these long brushy hairs that go all down their legs and they just get kind of filled up with pollen. So these are similar size to some of the smaller bumblebees. They're stout, small to medium sized bees. Um, one 
clue for these bees is that they're most common later in the summer. So, so they really start showing up kind of mid-July here in Minnesota. And, um, and they also really like plants that are in the sunflower family. So a lot of times you see these bees on, on um, sunflowers and asters and things like that. So, um, so a lot of times in the fall, a lot of times on these composite flowers and um, for females looking out for these really brushy hind leg hairs for the male looking out for males that have really long antennae. If you want to get into the weeds, you can look at this little thing here at the end of the wing and they have kind of a unique shape where they get narrowed at the end. So um, with all of this, there's always more to dig into. And we have about 27 species in, in Minnesota um, of, of those, so pretty diverse, a, a lot of different um, leafcutter bees. Small carpenter bees, so these are um, smaller bees than, the, than what we've been talking about, so smaller than honeybees, which probably most people are familiar with. These are blue metallic. A lot of times they have yellow facial markings and um, the puppy dog paws, a lot of times they, they kind of sit with their, their hands, kind of um, their, their, their front legs will be kind of curled up like puppy dogs. They also have this kind of barrel shape to their, to their abdomen with a little point at the end this is one of the things that kind of sticks out to me when I'm looking for them. So we have um, around four different different species of these. And um, if you wanna get into telling these apart, you have to start looking at these little dots that they have on their thorax and um, how dense are those dots. So um, they, but these are very common. They nest in, um, in stems and they like to have stems that still have the pith in them, the, that kind of fuzzy stuff that's in there. So if you're interested in pro providing habitat for these bees, um, having some, um, some, if you're cutting back perennials, having some perennials that you cut back that have that kind of fluff stuff still in there, that's what, um, that's what these bees like best. Oh, someone is asking um, for seeing melisodes on sunflowers. Um, are they oligolectic or just picky? So oligolectic means that bees are dependent on one particular type of plant for all of their pollen and nectar, um, or, or pollen, I, I'm sorry. Um, and their larvae actually cannot develop if you give them pollen from another kind of plant. So there are a lot of melisodes, the chap-legged bees, that are oligolectic, that are um, specialist bees is another word we use for them. So they, um, they will be dependent sometimes um, not on a specific exact species of plant, but some of them will just visit within a, a genus of plants. Um, so, so a lot of times, um, you know, for, for, um, for sunflowers or goldenrods, they'll just, they'll be a species of these Melisodes bees that will just visit, um, just visit goldenrods, for example. Elaine. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, but we just had a question, fluff stuff. They aren't quite sure what you mean by that. If you could give a little explanation. <laughs> yeah. So, um, this is a more of a plant question, but um, when, uh, so in plant stems, if you cut plant stems and you look inside, um, there's the, the pith is kind of what the stuff that's at the center of the stem. And some plants will naturally be kind of hollow and some in that, in that pith area, especially um, at the end of the season. And others will still have a bunch of kind of fluffy stuff that's in that center of the stem. So it's just, it's pith. It's the pith of the stem. Um, so, so it's just, is the, uh, the different kinds of, um, having a different variety of native plants, you'll be able to have um, some plants that have fluffy pith, some plants that don't, ha having different, um, Plants that have different diameters of stems will help support um, the, the diversity of, of bees. 
All right. This next one is a big, broad category because, as I said, there's lots of bees out there. And at some point, you got to start kind of lumping them together just to start somewhere. And eventually, if you really get into pollinator ID, you can start picking these apart. But um, there's a category of bees. This is just my name for the bees. I call them armpit bees because of where they carry their pollen. So the chap leg bees, they're ca carrying their, their pollen kind of down on the lower part of their legs. These bees are carrying them up in the upper part of their legs. Um, kind of in their in their armpits of their hind legs. But this covers a lot of different bees, but these are medium to small size bees. And you just have to look for kind of where they're, they're carrying their pollen. A lot of them are dark. Some of them have striped abdomens. Getting into the, the different kinds of, of bees you might see. So Kalides is, um, is a group of bees that um, fit into this armpit category. So they carry their pollen mostly up on the upper part of their hind leg. They, if you look closely, they have these heart-shaped faces, which is one of the features that you can use to pick these apart. They're most active in the spring. Um, and there are um, around 16 species. I do need to, to update these numbers. We recently came out with a, with a paper um, looking at bees of Minnesota and updating our numbers. So um, I'm, I, I didn't have time to update my presentation completely based on that. So that's why I have these like maybe 16 species. Um, and also even with that document coming out um, where we found 508 species of bees in Minnesota, we still, even since publishing that just three months ago, I think we're already up to 512. So it's it's the numbers only going to get bigger. These numbers are only going to get bigger as we um, we and other people around Minnesota are um, finding more bee species all the time. And um, you can help look for these too, taking photos of of bees that you find. Another big group are Andrina. These are mining bees. And we have um, over 80 species of Andrina in Minnesota. A lot of these are specialists that will visit certain types of flowers um, and you know, mostly carrying their pollen up in this upper part of their, their hind legs. Um, they, um, they tend to have these kind of flatter abdomens. Um, is one of the features I look for when I'm just IDing these out, out in the wild. Um, and so, yeah, a really interesting group, lots of specialist bees, um, huge variety that we have here um, in, the, in the Midwest. Another really um, fascinating bee are, are um, Perdida. Their common name is fairy bees. And, um, we have at least six different species here in Minnesota. Um, they will um, a lot of times nest in sandy soil. So these are ground nesters. Um, and a lot of them like sandy soils. Also a lot of specialists here. Um, this one, this picture behind me is, is a perdida. And um, this is a, a perdida bee that is a specialist on dahlia, on purple prairie clover and white prairie clover, just on the prairie clovers. Well, a common bee that you'll see around are um, helictus. This is a type of sweat bee. And um, they're basically kind of all over the place. Not very many species, but they're super abundant. Um, if you're you're looking at they they have these stripy waists. They will have hair bands that are kind of um, at, that are at the end of these these um, different segments of their their abdomens, as opposed to lazy glossum, which can look very similar. But their hairs are up at the tops of the segments rather than at the ends of the segments. So these are really diverse. Um, these are also, some of these are very small, super abundant. These are probably um, what you're going to see most out in the Midwest. Difficult to ID to species, um, but, but still um, fascinating. Some are, are social living, living colonies together. Green metallic bees. This is a, an easier group to pick apart. This is a type of sweat bee. They're in the family Helictidae. And so these are 
medium to small um, bees and they have green metallic, bright green metallic, either um, on their head and thorax or sometimes also their abdomen. One thing to, to watch out for is that there are some green metallic wasps. And um, if you, you know, if you look closely, you can see how, how different this looks with the really pitted structure on their exoskeleton here. Um, and also not, not fuzzy and carrying a bunch of pollen like the green metallic bee. Another big group of bees are the leafcutter bees. So these belong to the family Megachylidae. So this is a whole different family, which one of the main things about them is that they're carrying their pollen on their bellies. And um, they cut leaves to line their nests. So these bees tend to have broad heads because they have these big mandibles that they use to cut leaves. So they tend to be stocky, broader, um, big-headed bees. So there are a few different types of leafcutter bees. Um, Megachyle is a genus that's the most common here. They're common in, in um, kind of all open environments um, throughout in urban areas, in, in agricultural areas. And um, some of these males have these big fuzzy front legs. So you might see some of these males hanging out on flowers, especially later in the summer with these big kind of mittens. So they look like they have mittens on and they have bright, um, a lot of times their eyes are big and green. So those are fun to look out for. Anthidium is another group within the leaf cutters um, that can be common. They are less fuzzy, so um, but they are um, they collect hairs on the leaves rather than just collecting pieces of the leaves. So these are also ca called carter bees. So a lot of times you'll see these hanging out near things like lamb's ear, those fuzzy flowers, um, fuzzy fuzzy plants, fuzzy leaves that they are. Um, gathering stuff to line their, their nests with. Um, and we do have, there's both native and introduced species in Minnesota and then in the upper Midwest with these bees. Um, Hoplitis are another group of bees, leafcutter bees that have their um, pollen carrying hairs on the bottom. They're relatively common. They're um, smaller than the typical leafcutter bees, um, the, those bigger megachyle leafcutter bees. But um, these, once you start looking for them, you'll start seeing these smaller bees that also are carrying, carrying pollen on the um, bottom of their abdomens and most likely hoplitis. Mason bees, these get um, get a lot of positive word of mouth from people because they are um, great for, for pollinating, um, pollinating in orchards. So there is a, one of the species called the orchard mason bee. These bees come out in early spring. So they're um, used actually commercially sometimes for um, apple pollination. But um, similar to the, to the other leaf cutter bees, kind of stocky and broad, pollen collecting on the underside, but these are metallic blue. So, um, so mostly look out for these in the early spring. There are some species that will, will show up later in the season too. But um, in my yard in the city here in St. Paul, I mostly see them in the, in the spring on those like apples and cherries and things like that. And um, yeah, there are um, a, a few, some, not all of them are super bright. Some of them get super fuzzy, pretty good variety of, of different things to look out for with those bees. Another group that, um, that you really have to, to look for and be convinced that, that, um, that um, they're a bee <laughs> are the yellow-faced bees. So these are small, they're, they're kind of wasp-like. They're not super hairy. They actually don't have pollen collecting hairs, many pollen collecting hairs, um, but they're these little black bees with, with yellow marks on the face. And um, they can be fairly common, especially um, kind of midsummer, um, starting kind of from late spring through, um, through the summer. And um, pretty diverse, but 
very difficult to tell them apart from each other. So be happy if you can just recognize that, that this one is a bee. There are also wasps that look very similar in size and shape. But um, if you look closely here, hopefully you can see some differences. This wasp has this really big head. This is called a square-headed wasp because it has this big, chunky head. Um, so once you look closely, will look different. This picture isn't the best for showing it, but they do also have uh, that wider hind leg that I mentioned that, that bees have. Another really cool group of bees are the cuckoo bees. And these are bees that don't make their own nest. They go in and take over nests of other bees. So these a lot of times look more wasp-like, but they're, they're really colorful. They can be really handy for finding nests of other bees because these cuckoo bees will be flying around, zooming into nests of these of other bees, which can be um, can be hard to find. So these are really cool, fascinating bees um, that um, that you can pretty easily see, especially um, in the early early spring. The nomada bees like to go after the the minor bees, which are often active in the spring. All right, going to use some of, of what we've been, been learning. So um, I had to get a lot of information out there, but now I want to give you a chance to, um, to test what you've learned. So look at this and see if you can find the hummingbird moth. And you can just, to yourself, you can just, you can you put it in the chat if you want, or you can just think it to yourself. Number nine. All right, so uh, we talked a little bit about hummingbird moths active May through August. Um, really fascinating insects. All right, can you find the honeybee here? Number five is the honeybee. How about the green metallic sweat bee? There's a couple different metallic ones here, so be careful. Number one was our green metallic sweat bee. How about the bumblebee? Number eight is our bumblebee. All right, got a couple more here. How about a yellow jacket? Which I'm sure pretty much everyone has probably seen a yellow jacket at some point. Number 12 was our yellow jacket. And we call them a wannabe. A lot of people confuse yellow jackets and wasps. And a lot of people um, get upset about, I mean, yellow jackets and bees. They get upset about bees because of something um, run in with, with yellow jackets, but, um, but definitely different organisms. How about the flower fly? These are ones that you're, you'll sure to see once you start start paying attention more to the tiny things that are flying around out there. Number four is our flower fly. Um, they're also sometimes called hover flies. All right, how about paper wasps? There are a couple wasps here that might look like a paper wasp. But number 11 is our paper wasp. All right, so um, I am going to spend a bit of time talking about bumblebees. And um, the reason why I'm going to talk about bumblebees is um, because they're easier to find than a lot of other, other bees, um, par partly because of their size. So the picture I have here, these are both bees we have in, in Minnesota, a bumblebee and a little teeny tiny sweat bee. Huge difference in size. Um, so generally kind of easier to, to see bumblebees. They're easier to take photos of and share with, with, um, with, 
with other people who can help you identify them. They are generally easier to ID. It doesn't mean they're 100% easy, but they're definitely easier than a lot of other groups of bees. We also have a lot of historic records of bumblebees. So, um, so they're a group that we focus on for a lot of our efforts where we engage the public to help us survey for bees because um, we have more information to compare to in the past to figure out what's going on with bees. So um, what, part of the reasons why we have people help us survey for bumblebees is that they are there are a lot of bumblebees of conservation concern. So about one out of every um, four species of bumblebees are of conservation concern. And what we learn from them from our um, survey information can help with habitat management to help preserve those bees and help recovery of bees that are of conservation concern. Um, they're also a good way to connect to the bee world. So they're, they're big and fuzzy. When you go visit them at flowers, they're really gentle. It's a really good way to just get started with bees. So I wanted to mention the our Bumblebee Atlas program. So we have a Bumblebee Atlas program that you can join here in Minnesota, but it is um, all of these states that are colored in have um, some kind of Bee Atlas program either happening or about to start happening as well as up in Alaska, but I had to cut off the picture here. Um, the yellow ones are our partner efforts. So if you're in any of those states, I encourage you to um, to look into joining a Bumblebee Atlas survey. And um, Elise and I are um, two of the people running the Minnesota. So if you're in, in Minnesota and you want to join the Atlas, um, we will um, see more of you. <laughs> um, I also wanted to mention for bumblebees, another thing you can do if you're not ready to commit to a whole program with the Atlas, if you just have some time during the last couple weeks of July to go out and take photos of bumblebees, you can share them on iNaturalist. So you can have iNaturalist as an app on your phone or you can visit them on their website and um, you can um, share any observations you have of bumblebees there and they will become part of this backyard bumblebee account program. So for um, figuring out bumblebees, I'm going to first start out with talking about um, the big three. So throughout the Midwest, around 80% of the bumblebees that you see will be one of these three species. So we've got impatiens, which is the common eastern bumblebee, bimaculatus, the two-spotted bumblebee, and griseocolis, the brown-belted bumblebee. And basically for the common eastern bumblebee, the simplest feature to look for is, um, well, look for two things. You can first look and see their thorax and see that it's mostly yellow. And then on their abdomen, just their first segment is yellow and the rest of their, um, the rest of their abdomen there is, is black. And um, Tara, you can also share there, there, I have a resource that's a, um, a link to a PDF that is a guide to Minnesota bumblebees. This guide works kind of throughout the, the Midwest, thank you. So that's there in the chat now. Um, so that's something that you can use also to help you pick apart all these bees. Okay, common Eastern, main takeaways. Thorax is mostly yellow. First segment of the abdomen is also yellow. Rest of it is black. So here are a few photos showing. We can see this yellow here, a lot of black down the rest of the abdomen. Two spotted bumblebee, Bombus bimaculatus starting with the same thing as, as the common Eastern, but then on the second segment, two spots. Hence the name two-spotted bumblebee. So um, here is a little video showing a nest with a, a queen and her workers. And you can kind of see as they walk around, it can be hard to see when they have their wings over, but um, when they move their wings away, you can kind of see all yellow. And then on the second segment, there's um, these spots that show up. So here's a nice photo showing, um, showing these two big spots with black on the sides of that second segment. 
So the third of our big three, this is the brown belted bumblebee, starting again with the same kind of thing, yellow thorax. First segment of the abdomen is all yellow, but then these bees have this swoop across the second segment that has yellow and then this kind of rusty brown color. And so from the side, you can see this kind of swoopy shape. You can see this kind of rusty color coming in there. They also have, um, if you see the males around, they have really big eyes. Here's that, that, that rusty spot can sometimes be subtle. Sometimes it can be really big. Sometimes it's more red. Sometimes it's more brown. Um, but this is a brown belted worker. Okay. Now this one, I'm going to have you type in the chat if you think it's a common Eastern, a two spotted, or a brown belted. So um, we can see this kind of shape here that looks kind of we but it is um all just on the first segment so so this is the first segment here and then this is the second segment so i see a lot of people with two spotted coming in but this is actually a common eastern but this is um Sometimes this, this shape here where it looks kind of W-E will trick people into thinking that it's the two spots, but you'll see that there's yellow all the way to the sides here. So this is just yellow on the first segment. Okay, how about this bee? Well, I'll, I'll already let you know, this is a trick. <laughs> this one is a honeybee, it's not a bumblebee. All right, I'm gonna quickly kind of go through some of these other groups of bees, just so you know what's out there. Focusing mostly on those first, those big three, those are mostly what you're going to see. But um, you'll also might see some of these bees that have a lot of yellow on them. And we basically have, have two bees that'll do that. Um, either Fervinus, the Golden Northern. Oh, I'm bad with common names. The Yellow Bumblebee or the Boreal Bumblebee. <laughs> Um, uh, Fervidus is yellow bumblebee and <laughs> Borealis is northern amber bumblebee. Northern amber. <laughs> sometimes it's called the boreal. So that's the thing with common names is sometimes they, yeah, <laughs> give you different names. These you can tell apart by what's happening on the, the front of the head and the side of the thorax. Borealis has yellow on the front, brown on the side, kind of opposite with Fervidus where they have yellow on the side, um, dark hairs on the front. Then we have um, these bees that have yellow on the first two segments of the abdomen. The most common one you'll see is this Bombus vagans, the half black bumblebee. And um, this one you can see, you can see here the, the first two segments of the abdomen are all yellow. We do have some bees in the Midwest here that have red on them or orange. Um, and so, <laughs> Um, one of them is very confusing. The red belted bumblebee, Rufocinctus. These are all color patterns for the red belted bumblebee. So if you don't know what a bumblebee is and it doesn't seem to match any color patterns, it's probably a red belted bumblebee. But a very common one, especially in the northern Midwest, is the tri-colored bumblebee. And so this one has these two big segments of orange that are sandwiched between segments of yellow on the abdomen. And then we also have a few species that have a lot of black on their thorax. And so, um, so, so these are a lot of times big bumblebees. There are two different species. Um, you have to get these kind of close looks at what's happening on their abdomen or what's happening on their head to tell these apart. We have a lot more resources for this if you really want to get into telling all these apart um, with the, the Bumblebee Atlas. If you visit our Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas website, we have videos there talking through all of these. The yellow banded bumblebee is very similar too, but has um, is, is kind of shorter and stouter and has yellow at the end. 
I wanted to um, make sure I talk about the rusty patch bumblebee, which is an endangered species. So I wanna make sure people know what to look for for that bee. I wanna first mention cuckoo bumblebees. So I mentioned cuckoo bees before that go in and take over nests of other bees. So there is a, um, a few species of cuckoo bumblebees that are bumblebees, but they go in and take over the nests of other bumblebees. And um, they do not have the, the pollen carrying baskets like the bumblebees do. So they have, um, they have some kind of longer hairs, but you see they don't have that indent and the shiny basket on their hind leg um, because they don't need to carry pollen. These bees just go in and take over the nest and rely on the workers of the other species to go and collect all the pollen. They also have kind of big, thick heads. And that's probably just because they have to have stronger mandibles to fight their way into these other nests. So um, this is comparing kind of the, the depth of the heads. So the parasitic bumblebees have these big, thick heads. Okay. Rusty patch bumblebee. Um, this is a species that's of conservation concern. It's federally protected as an endangered species, but we're lucky here in the Midwest that they are still here. There's lots of parts of its former range in the Eastern part of the US where they've just 100% disappeared and haven't been seen for 20 years. They may still be there. We may still find them. They may repopulate the area, but Minnesota, we've been able to actually keep our populations here as well as through Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin. So, um, so yes, someone is asking where you should report your rusty patch bumblebee sightings. We are really excited to have people share when they do find these, taking photos of those bees and sharing them on Bumblebee Watch is the best way to do that. So um, we talked about the Bumblebee Atlas. We use um, a portal called Bumblebee Watch, but you can also report bumblebees without being part of the Atlas. You can just take photos of bumblebees and share them in Bumblebee Watch. They do have an app. The app's a little hard to use still. That's being um, tweaked right now. It's best to kind of use their web portal. So if you take a photo and then afterwards at home, share on Bumblebee Watch. You can also report your rusty patch bumblebee findings on iNaturalist. That works as well. Um, scientists will, will see the records there and, and it's really important for us to know where the bumblebees, where the rusty patch bumblebees are so we can know where, um, where they need protecting. All right, so rusty patch bumblebee ID. Instead of being just all yellow on the thorax, they have this kind of band of black between their wings and a bit of black coming back, kind of a thumbtack or umbrella shape. They have those first two segments are mostly yellow, but then in the middle of that, there is this rusty patch. The queens, unfortunately, um, for the namesake, actually don't have a rusty patch. Um, or that, that spot between the wings. Um, so the queens look a little different. You'll mostly just see those in the spring and the fall. Um, but here's a photo where you can see these black hairs, uh, kind of umbrella shape. You can see a bit of this rusty patch there. Um, males, sometimes the, the thorax band is less, is hard to see, but you can still definitely see the patch. Um, sometimes it's hard to see the rusty patch from under the wings, but we can see the black hairs there. And this is a nice shot showing a nice, big, bright, rusty patch. Um, more subtle character is that they'll, they'll sometimes have black hairs under their wings. The queens I mentioned are um, don't have <laughs> this rusty patch, um, but they're really big they're really kind of um, velvety short cropped hairs. They're really distinctive. So if you can take photos and share them, um, experts can go in and, and pick these apart as well. Um, hopefully you can, can recognize these too once you get used to kind of looking for bees in the springtime. And um, so, so the Aphanus queens here are, are really big. So that's one of the things that, that helps us tell them apart. They have a similar color pattern to some of these other bees, but they're so much bigger. All right, another little quiz. 
this is just going to be, is it a rusty patch bumblebee or is it not a rusty patch bumblebee? So in the chat, you can just put yes or no. Getting some no's, getting some yeses. Someone put in a two spot guess. So this, it does look like there's kind of might be this kind of thorax pattern here, but um, this is just some yellow hairs here and there's black at the sides of this second segment. So this is not a rusty patch bumblebee. A rusty patch bumblebee would have yellow all the way across that second segment and would have just the rusty patch right there. So this is a two spotted bumblebee. All right, next one. Yes or no, rusty patch. Some yeses, some noes. some brown belts. So this does, we can see this kind of rusty color here, right? And it is on the second segment, but this is not a rusty patch bumblebee. This is a brown belted. If it was a rusty patch on the other side of this rusty patch would still be yellow. So their rusty patch is all surrounded with yellow. The brown belted has what pretty much is a rusty patch, but it's surrounded by black on that back end. All right, how about this one? Rusty patch, yes or no? Lots of yeses here. So yep, we've got this rusty patch and it's yellow kind of all around it. And this is actually a male. Um, this one, I'm just gonna skip ahead to the answer because this one is tricky. This one is actually a rusty patch queen. So it, she doesn't have the rusty patch, but she's a nice, big, beautiful rusty patch bumblebee queen. This is a blurry picture, but this is a lesson that even if your pictures are blurry, they can still sometimes be used for ID as long as we can see what we need to see. So you, you, yes or no, rusty patch. Getting some mostly no's, some yeses, a couple tri-colored. So um, this one, um, the, this is a tri-colored bumblebee. And um, it does have, tri-coloreds do have that same kind of umbrella shape, but their rusty color patch they have is big, bright and orange and goes all the way across segments two and three. Whereas if this was rusty patch, there would just be a rusty patch kind of at the top of the second segment and it would be um, all black below that. Um, it would be, sorry, it would be all yellow below on that second segment. And then from segment three down would be all black. So where this segment three is all orange, that would be all black on the rusty patch bumblebee. Okay, one more. Lots of yeses. So yep, this has the umbrella shape and it has the rusty patch surrounded by yellow. So um, I wanted to share a couple of helpful resources. If you do want to get more into ID, if you want to get into to bumblebees, there's this great book, Bumblebees of North America. I mentioned we also have lots of great resources to share through the Bumblebee Atlas program. So, um, so, so even if you're not surveying, you can come and look at the resources and learn how to ID bees. Um, if you're interested in bees just in general, there are a couple great books, um, Bees, an Identification and Native Plant Forage Guide by Heather Holm. Um, is a wonderful resource about identifying bees and also the plants they use. And The Bees in Your Backyard by um, Joseph Wilson and Olivia Messenger Carroll has 
really um, a ton of information about how to tell these bees apart and their biology. So um, you probably have a million questions that were, were raised into how these things are living. Um, that's a great resource for helping with that. The Heather Home book is a great resource for IDing and um, connecting with, with the flowers that are, are best to support those bees. Um, so I do um, have, a, a, of course, wanted to leave more time for questions, but hopefully have some time for some questions. Um, before we get into that, I just did just want to talk about um, the the value of, of pollinators. Um, the more time you spend looking at them, learning to ID them, getting to know them, um, you'll get to really know more about what they're doing out there. They have this really important role as, as connectors out there. So making safe spaces for them, raising awareness about them, gathering and sharing information. Those are all actions that you can take to, to help pollinators. And by helping pollinators, you're connecting insects to plants, you're connecting plants to people, and hopefully we're, we'll also connect people to each other through this kind of message of the importance of connection that, that, um, that pollinators, one of their great gifts they have for us is this opportunity for us to see how important that is. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Elaine. You can see all the applause and the hearts and the thumbs up that we're seeing in the chat. As always, you did a wonderful job presenting and really helping us understand how to recognize the different pollinators that we might be seeing around us. So thank you so much. We do have a lot of questions, so we'll get to what we can, but I do want to launch uh, this poll, your after presentation poll. This really helps um, get feedback for us and and when you fill it out it should disappear when you click submit so let's get to a couple of questions the first one um are most bees capable of multiple stings yes um it's pretty much just the honeybee that has a barbed end at the the end of of the sting that will stick into your skin um and pull her guts out and kill her but um that said a lot of the bees that you see out there are actually males males don't have a stinger so a lot of these other bees you see a lot of males out there um and they, they, they can't even possibly sting you. And a lot of the solitary bees have really um, weak stings, so they can't even penetrate your skin. So even though theoretically, all of these other bees have the females have stingers, a lot of them can't really effectively sting you. And in regards to that pie chart that you showed us, was it the relative abundance about the number of species or the number? Of that species? was just the number of species. So that's a whole different question of like who is out there on the landscape. Very, very interesting. Um, how far will native bees and wasps range to find new habitat? There are, um, there's a, people have figured out a ratio uh, for for the size of the bee, um, I'm not sure if the, it's if if it's similar for for wasps for for bees. They're they're traveling out and and returning to their nest. So we know that how far they travel from their nest is based on how big they are. So for the really small bees, some of them are only flying you know like less than a quarter of a mile um, away from their from their nest, um, whereas others will fly you know several miles away. Very cool. They they travel far. <laughs> Uh, wasps are aggressive. How aggressive in general were all those different bees that you talked about? So for, for the wasps are aggressive, there's a lot of wasps that aren't aggressive. So there are social wasps like the yellow jackets that are aggressive because they have a nest that they're protecting. But the vast majority of wasps are solitary. They don't have a nest that they're protecting and they're, they're um, completely docile. <laughs> Um, so, so that that aggressive thing for bees also goes for for their social behavior. So, um, so things like um, honeybees and bumblebees, they're social bees that live in a nest together. And if you, especially with bumblebees, if you're like right at the nest, they can be aggressive. But if you're at the flower, they're completely not aggressive. And other the solitary bees, even if you're right on the nest, right, like walking on top of the nest, digging up their nest, they're not aggressive even right at the nest. Funny. Um, 
how could our weird winter and potentially weird spring impact our native bees? Yeah, it is a concern. So um, a lot of bees right now, they're they're overwintering in different stages. Um, bumblebees are overwintering as queens. Other bees are overwintering in stems or underground um, as as larvae or pupae. And the thing that we don't know is when the temperature gets gets higher, if it kind of turns on their metabolism and they start using up some of their resources, um, they're, they're well adapted for what it usually is here, where there's the ground is insulated, for one thing, um, with with snow cover. Um, and also those the the temperatures are are cold. So there's kind of a combination of things here where we have this super warm weather, which may make them use up resources they have. But we also through the warm weather don't have the snow. And then if it gets super cold again, that cold will go further down into the ground and might expose them to colder temperatures than they're adapted for as well. Um. When do we start counting the invasion of invasives, colonization, intensive native distance trading? Mm. Yeah, there's um, there's a lot of you know just different species that end up moving around, you know, with pe with people, and um, you know, at some point there's um, yeah, there, there's a lot of different ideas about kind of you know, how, how best to process that in terms of the, the future of the world, um, you know, but at, at, at some point, um, you know, just kind of supporting native habitats as, as much as you can, can help keep those strengthened and, and hopefully um, get them kind of bolstered up to be able to, to maintain themselves despite um, species that aren't part of their usual ecosystem showing up and making themselves at home. I think we'll do two more questions. We're pushing it for time, but there was a lot of good questions in the chat. Um, how? What can you share about how bees or wasps see? Is it ultraviolet? Do they have a broader sight capabilities, form, shape? shape? Yep. Yeah, they have a similar range, but it's shifted. So they don't see into um, into red but they see into ultraviolet so they see different patterns on flowers there's ultraviolet patterns on flowers that they can see that we can't um they they are really good at honing in on on movement and they use their sight a lot for for navigation uh, do bees that are miles away finding pollen fly home every night or do they spend the night where they can they do. And once in a while, they'll get stuck if there's weather or something like that. Um, and they, they might be left out overnight. But um, in general, they're they're flying home every night. Um, at some point in the season, um, at least for the for the for the social bees, um, for the for the solitary bees, sometimes the, the males kind of leave the nest after they hatch and they they never go back. They just kind of hang out. And I lied. I'll do one more question. <laughs> what is the species of the white wasp behind? Hmm. So that is not a wasp. That's a bee. You'll notice there's all of this pollen on the legs down there. And this is Perdita purpallida. It's a um, called a fairy bee, native bee to Minnesota and the Midwest, and a specialist on this flower, which is the purple prairie clover. Any one of you see that this summer, be sure to email us a picture of it. Um, but that wraps up, I think, today for our second session. Thank you to all the audience members for your great, great questions. If you didn't get them answered, I'll be giving um, Elaine's contact information as well as all of our local extension offices. Um, you can ask those questions there as well. So this concludes the second session of the Meet Your Pollinators webinar series. Hopefully we'll see you all tomorrow for the next presentation on integrated pest management and pollinators with Marissa Shu. Take care, everyone.